Beautiful. Okay, so we're going through a little series at the moment on spiritual gifts, and today we're going to be looking at Ephesians 4. Adam Voak from Cornerstone City Church did speak from this same chunk of scripture, and I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, and so we're going to look through with the New Living Translation. So I'm not expecting you all to have it. So what I would love us to do, I think it's a bit of a theme this morning. We took communion all together, but we're going to read this all together as well, if that's all right. And so, uh, Jonathan, if you can track through as I read it, could you all read it with me? So we're all going to read it out loud together. Is that okay? So what are we going to do? Read it out together. Together. Lovely. Okay, so um, here we go. So Ephesians 4, verse 1, and again, New Living Translation, it says this, Therefore, uh, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all of the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. I'm just going to pause there. Some of you have dropped out, so get back involved. Uh, I, can hear the, 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 I can hear more of me than I can of you. So is that all right? So we're on verse 14. Uh, okay, three, two, one. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Have I missed a bit? Oh, let's go back then. What was it? 13. Sorry. Well done, Jonathan. Thanks, mate. So this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Nearly there. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. What a chunk. What a chunk of scripture. And so there's a lot in there. Um, I like to think of this as a problem sandwich. Um, you might wonder what I mean by, by that. But there are, there are two problems that are explained and the solution is in, in between the two problems. Is that okay? And so shout out to me. What are one or two of the problems that you noticed it said? in there. Shout out, don't be shy, or this will be very long. So what's something that you've picked up that might be a problem? I've given a hint at the start or the, or the end. Yeah, people try and trick us with lies. There are ways of teaching things happening in the world that sound really great, sound really, really brilliant, sound like the best way. It's new, it's exciting. It, it gets rid of everything that's old and, I've got to watch the, the camera, but it gets rid of everything that's old and like we live in a new era. So let's change the way we think about one another and do we need a God anymore? Like, what, what does it matter who I have a relationship with? There's all these things, new waves of teaching that sound wonderful, sound loving, but they trick us, they lead us astray. New ways of teaching. It says that we could be immature like children, that we can be tossed and blown around by every new kind of teaching. New things, sound exciting. That we won't be influenced when people try and trick us with lies. 
So there are people that are going to come amongst us as God's people. This is talking about the church. It's not talking about the world. This is talking about people who should be living and honouring Jesus as the king of their life. That people are going to come amongst the church with new types of teaching and with lies and with deception. Things that are so clever that they sound like things like that Jesus might say. And it says instead, speak the truth together to one another in love. The, the problems at the beginning are this. I love this. Paul says, and Sarah just touched on this, therefore I, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord. So Paul's saying I'm a prisoner. But the reason I'm a prisoner is because I've been honouring Jesus. So this isn't actually a problem. It's actually a good thing because he wouldn't be a prisoner if he'd got in line with what everyone else did. So much like last night, I don't want to make any analogies about Donald Trump and all that Christ-like stuff. I think you can get in some very weird places. But when you're known for speaking the truth and people don't like what you have to say, there is a price on your head. And whether it's physically or whether it's spiritually, as soon as you start proclaiming truth, the enemy's going to be after you. Now, whether the enemy is people or whether it's spiritually the devil, you've now got a mark on your head. So if you want to be known for the truth, expect your life to be difficult. Expect people not to get it. Expect people not to like what you have to say. And if you want an easy life, just keep your head down and go along with the flow and, and watch what happens to your relationship with God as you do that. It might get easier on this level, but actually at what cost? Is that okay? Are we okay with that, with me saying that? One of the other problems is, is Paul says, I'm a prisoner for serving the Lord and I beg you, these are strong words. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Can you imagine Paul on his knees? I beg you. I beg you, lead a life. Live a life that's worthy of the calling that you've got. Why? Because you've been called by God. This isn't just a job. This isn't a, you've been promoted. God himself, Jesus Christ, has called you to something. Live a life worthy to that calling. Don't settle for anything less than that. Amen. Amen. You're allowed to heckle or encourage. God wants our very best. He doesn't want compromise. And so Paul's speaking to the church. He's saying, I have been uncompromising in my service of the church and it's got me into prison. And I encourage you to do the same. Not because you want to be in prison, but because you want to be faithful to the one who has called you. Because he is higher than every other person that could call you to something else. Way higher. We've got to check who is on the throne of our heart. Who is the one we're living for? Who is the one we're following? Who is the one we're getting our bearings from? Who's the one we're trying to please? Who's the one that we're trying to outwork what they're asking us to do? Is it him or is it us or is it someone else? Two of those aren't going to get us into a good place. One could end us up in a physical prison, but it won't end us up in a spiritual one. If we try and live for other people, you might not be in a physical prison, but you'll end up in a spiritual one pretty quick. That's what happens. And so he goes on. What this looks like, so living like Paul, it says, always be humble and gentle. So he's talking to the church. So church, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Is there anyone in this room right now that winds you up? You're probably related to them. That's normally what happens, isn't it? Be patient with them. Be patient with them. Kids, do your parents wind you up? Yeah, we, we know for a fact. Yeah, Troy's giving me a little side look. Your mum and dad are behind. They can't see that you... Yeah. But in relationships, it's difficult, isn't it? And if we've got meaningful relationships with one another, that means we're going to tread on one another's toes at some point. We're going to say some things that we might not like. Be patient with one another. Don't just up sticks, go to another church because it'll be better there and then six months later do the same thing again and again and again. Invest meaningfully in relations. Be patient with one another. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And also, I might add, Paul, because you didn't put it in there, but you should have, because you've got faults as well, if you didn't realise that. Can I get an amen for that bit? Yeah, yeah, amen, amen, yeah, yeah. Less of a response for that bit. And this is the bit that I think, before we get into the solution, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. So there is something going on in the world, the problem that we looked at at the end, that's trying to divide the church. It's trying to split you off and pick you off like a lion. The enemy's like a lion prowling around looking for people to devour. How do lions take out gazelles? They run at the pack, get one picked off, and then they go for that one. They don't go for the whole lot. They pick one off. 
They separate them and then they overwhelm them and deluge them and then ultimately they devour them. And so here it's saying stay united, stay together. Church, there's a wave of teaching coming. There there are things coming. There are people coming into your midst that are going to try and divide you, going to try and convince you of things that sound amazing. They promise everything like sin always does. I say this every time. What does sin do? It promises everything and it delivers nothing. And this is what we're hearing is that sin is going to promise you everything. The enemy is going to say, you know what? You can have all the power. You can have all the authority. You can be someone that everyone loves, but it's going to come at a cost. And that cost is going to be your soul. It's going to be your relationship with God. It's going to be your relationship with other people in the church. And you know what it'll do? It'll make you turn around and walk into hell. It'll be a living hell on earth and then it'll be an eternal hell, which is a grim place. So make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So if you're finding you're not at peace, then there's something off. If you're not at peace in your heart, there's something off. Have you already started to get separated in some ways? There's something that you're starting to believe or hold on to that's getting in the way between your relationship with God or amongst other people. If there's someone in the church you really can't relate with and you can't forgive, it might not be in this church, it might be the church you left to join this church. Get that sorted out quick. Because it'll be like, you only need one little cell of cancer in your body to, to ultimately experience death. And so don't entertain the smallest dot or jot of anything in your life that's going to bring death. Because anything that sits in the darkness, ultimately, will, will take, it'll rob you of all the life. There is one body. There's one spirit. Just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord, one faith. Like we heard from Sarah, there's one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who is over all, he's in all, and he's through all. There's a lot of alls there, isn't there? But that just means he's everywhere, in everything. He sees it all. He sees the things that you're doing this morning and he sees the things that you don't even know anyone else sees. He sees it all and it matters to him. And then there's this, so these are the problems. He's basically saying there's an enemy. He's trying to divide us. We're living in difficult days. The church is Jesus' crown and jewel. And the enemy's coming to try and dismember the body. He wants to keep the body immature. He wants to keep it weak. And he wants to keep it disconnected. When you dismember a body, it doesn't work anymore, does it? There's been some horrible stuff in the news, isn't there? Literally people dismembering bodies. My gosh. The enemy wants to dismember the church. He wants to pull us all apart. And disconnect us from the head. Because that's where the life is. Verse 7, it says, However, he's given each one of us, each one of you, every single one of you who knows and honours Jesus with your life and has made him the king of your life, each one of you has got a special gift through the generosity of Jesus, through the generosity of Christ, it says in verse 7. Yes. There's not a single one of you, if you're a believer this morning, that doesn't have a spiritual gift. That hasn't been entrusted something, not so that you can get a platform and a podium, but so that you can build up and encourage other believers. It's a beautiful thing. This is what the scriptures say. When he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and he gave gifts to his people. And I'm going to read the next bit. Notice he says that he ascended. So Jesus ascended. He went up to heaven, didn't he? He spent... He, And then, so it goes on. This clearly means that Christ also descended because you can't ascend unless you descend. And so there's a heavenly king. The solution to our problem is that Jesus came from heaven to earth. He descended into this broken world. And the one who descended is the one who ascended higher than the heavens. So he came to earth. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He died the death that he didn't deserve to die. And then he ascended, showing that he was victorious over death. He crushed the head of the enemy. And then... As he ascended, he led us with him, spiritually speaking, out of this broken world, out of slavery, out of bondage. If you think of Moses in Egypt, he led the people away from the grip of Pharaoh over the promised land where the sea engulfed, the Red Sea engulfed the enemy. There was no way back. They kept thinking about going back, but the sea separated them and ultimately the sea had devoured what was entrapping them and ensnaring them. This is what Jesus has done to us. He's gone into Egypt. He's led us out. He's made a way through the Red Sea. We're now in the promised land. 
but we need to live in the good of it. We need to lean into it and believe it to be true. Don't keep dreaming of Egypt like it's the better place to be. And I love this. We sang it earlier. And then Lizzie prayed it. But the same one who de- descended is the one who a- ascended higher than all of the heavens. Why? So that he might fill the entire universe. The entire universe with joy, with love, with peace. No, with himself. That Jesus would be everywhere. And then we get the joy, the peace. This isn't about self-fulfillment. This is about Jesus' fulfillment. Jesus fulfilling all of creation with himself. There's nothing above him. It's amazing. And then it goes on. And this is the bit that I meant to be preaching on. But Verse 11. Jonathan, would you be able to just follow through with these just as I go? So these are the Ephesians 4 gifts. It's like called the five-fold ministry. Some people argue that it's fourfold and shepherd and teacher are the same pastor teacher is the same ministry it doesn't really matter um, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church this is interesting because there's some hairs to split here but it's important so all of us have been given gifts by Jesus Christus Victor overcoming the enemy and then so I want you to imagine in the olden days you would go to war you you know imagine Lord of the Rings you take the territory next to you and then you get all of their spoils. Don't you? You've conquered the enemy. And then a good king, what does he do? He shares it with all of his army. And he shares it with everyone that's gone on the journey with him. Jesus has done the same. He has overcome sin. He's overcome death. He's overcome the grave. He's overcome the greatest enemy, the, like the devil, death himself. And everything that he's won through that victory, he has distributed to us. Those gifts are now ours. He doesn't keep it for himself like a greedy king, but he gives us Gifts. Christus Victor, the Victoria Christ, entrusts us spiritual gifts. This is his answer to the problem. Isn't that he would come, although that is part of it, but then the next part of that solution is that he would give us gifts. That is part of the strategy that he has come and done something amazing, but now it's over to us. The gifts are Christ himself, and interestingly here, the the gifts are people. So the people that he gives to the church, it says in verse 12, he's, he gives to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then it talks about them like their people. Verse 12, their responsibility. So he's not saying the gift that they've got, they've got to use it well. He's saying the responsibility of these people gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. So these are fully mature gifts. People who are entrusted to the church And their responsibility is to equip God's people, us, the church. So he's making a distinction. Yes, they are God's people too, but their job is to equip the church. And so this is a different type of gift. This isn't like a gift everyone's got. These are equipping gifts for the church. We call them translocal ministries in ours. But what these people do, they equip God's people to do his work and they build up the church. Jesus builds his church too, doesn't he? But here it says these people with these gifts build up the church so they're fulfilling the work of Christ amongst us but in imagine now this is a bit complicated and I'm I'm sure there's probably only a few of you that have done this but there's a a football game that Troy and Lewis play and maybe a few others have played called FIFA you're wondering where I'm going it's not because of the World Cup but there's a, a, a hexagon that it has for each of the players a hexagon I want you to imagine a hexagon no actually a, a pentagram it's, it's yeah, yeah it's five sides and um there's passing, there's shooting, there's speed, and there's a strength and a couple of others. And, um, and then you can tell how good a player is by how much they're f- leaning into each of those attributes or skills. And there's like a, 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 hexa- a pentagram or a hexagon, it doesn't matter what it is, but that fleshes out. Now, I want you to imagine apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. So a pentagram, not in a demonic sense, but a pentagon. Yeah, not a pe- pentagram to the witchcraft one, isn't it? We'll edit that bit out. Um, that's not going to communicate at all well on anything, is it? We're not that type of church. It's okay. But there's a pentagon and there's these different attributes. Now, it would be great to say, I'm a fully mature apostle. I'm a fully mature evangelist. I'm a fully mature prophet. I'm a fully mature shepherd. I'm a fully mature uh, teacher. In fact, you know what that would make me? Jesus, wouldn't it? 
And if any of you know me, I'm not Jesus. I might look a bit, you know, in some of the things that he's entrusted me to. But we need all of us to make the body known to the world. And so each of us have been given different type of gifts. But these people have been given to the church as gifts to the church to help them to grow up in these five areas, in these different attributes, so that the church matures into looking more like Jesus as a full body. All of us together. This isn't just about me and my life and what I watch online and me maturing. This is about us. One body, one spirit, one Lord, working together to make the head known so that, as it says later on, the whole body would grow into maturity. So if you imagine like a little baby, it's got like little, little dangly arms, little dangly legs, and you've got a fully mature head, a Jesus head, fully mature, but you've got an immature body, that would look really odd, wouldn't it? Walking around in the world, I'm here to make Jesus known, but there's this tiny little dangly baby body the purpose of these gifts is to help mature and grow and link together all of the parts that aren't mature, that haven't grown, that haven't developed yet. And so there's these five different gifts. And like I said, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, which is the body of Christ. It's not individuals, it's us all together. They're thinking about the church, the health of the church. And so I think for us as Western Christians, we've got a war really hard against individualism, about it all being about me, about me doing what I want to do, about me coming before everyone else, because that is one of these waves of teaching. We're all really great consumers and we're told that it's all about us and if we acquire goods and services, it makes us and fulfills us. If we get the biggest tele TV, we're better than the person that hasn't got the biggest TV, or if we get the biggest car, whatever it is, it's that thing, and it? Keeping up with the Joneses, we become consumers. Whereas here it's saying, actually, no, this is about all of us. Together, think of one another, think of everyone else more highly than you ought to. It's countercultural. But we, we grow up in this water, drinking it like fish, and we don't know that it's toxic. We're born into it. We have been for millennia. This is not a new thing. It's been going, it was going on 2,000 years ago when Paul was writing, and it's still going on today. It's just the teaching looks different, but the problem's the same. It's trying to lead you away from Jesus and lead you away from other people and disconnect you and pick you off. And so what I want to do, I just want to mention these five gifts. I'm just going to end there. And then I think there's three things I'd love us to respond to. We're going to deep dive into each of these gifts individually as separate talks, but I wanted to just mention each one. And so firstly, there's the apostles. And uh, basically, the role of the apostle is to extend the gospel, not necessarily in people, although it's always about people, but their eyes are on the nations. Their eyes are on the marginalized, on the poor. Their, their eyes are on the places where the church isn't. So the most underreached, the most underrepresented places. The word apostle is from the Greek word apostolos, which means sent. They are the sent ones. Now, we're not tr I'm not trying to confuse things. So some of you that have grown up in other traditions or been taught in other places might think that actually only the 12, the first 12 can be called apostles. But much like you might have a Billy Graham type evangelist, like a big hitter, you know, kind of platform winning thousands of souls. And then you might have an evangelist do someone who's great just around the dinner table, you know, with a cup of coffee leading someone to Jesus. There are different measures of the evangelistic gift. And similarly, there are different measures of all of the gifts and particularly the apostle. So my friend Steph Liston, who we've had in this church before, he, I would say, is a modern-day apostle. Does that mean he can add letters into the Bible? Well, of course not. It says in Revelation, no one is... And he wouldn't want to. He really wouldn't want to, if you know Steph. But these people are sent ones. In the classical term, they're sent with their eyes on the nations and some of the other things they do, they ensure that the faith is transmitted from one context or one group to another and it's entrusted from generation to generation. So one of the things we love about the church, and I don't say it just because there's parents in the room, but we love the fact that we've got younger generations with us because a big part of our role as parents, whether they're our children or not, is to entrust what we believe to be true to those who are younger than us. That's what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, that which I entrusted to you as of first importance, treat it like that and do the same to others. And so everything that we've learned, the good, the bad and the ugly, even the heresy, we're to let other people know about it, where it stands up and where it falls down. Because if we don't do that, that generation will be in peril when their time comes. Is that okay? Apostles are always thinking about the future. They're future-oriented. They're thinking about the next step, about bridging cultural barriers, about establishing the church in new places. 
about developing and raising up leaders who can be entrusted with responsibility. And they're always thinking about networking and connecting translocally with other churches, other groups, and advancing the kingdom of God. Sounds great, doesn't it? Every gift has got a weak and an immature expression. And what that might look like is if you focus solely as an apostle on initiating new ideas, rapid expansion, you can very quickly burn out the church, you can leave the church behind. Sometimes you can even think of the church or people just as almost like cogs in a machine to get the job done. There can be spiritual abuse, there can be neglect and a lack of care. So the apostles need the pastors and the teachers to bring that sense of together and that sense of we're all in it together. That sound okay? Okay, the next one is the prophets. All say after me, prophets. Prophets, Prophets. not prophets like you get from selling something for more than you bought it, but prophets, the ones who know God's will. Um, They're particularly attuned to God and particularly his truth for today. So when you read the Old Testament, one of the things the prophets did is they were really good at seeing where the, the, the people of God, the nation of Israel, particularly in the Old Testament, had fallen away from God's truth. They would call them back to faithfulness. They would call them back to repentance and say, we've drifted so far away. I think of the last good king of Israel, King Josiah, when they'd left the the word of the Lord out in the back office for a couple of generations. And then his um, holy man come to him and said, we've just found the Bible. Um, We just found like the Old Testament. We've found it. We found the Pentateuch. And um, you know what? We're not actually doing any of it. This is a bit of a problem. They were leading out of assumptions. They were leading out of, um, yeah, yeah, tradition, dead tradition. And King Josiah said, no, we've got to repent. Gosh, we're so far from God. And then there was a huge revival. We're turning back to God, a tearing down of everything that had set itself up in the generations before to honor Jesus. That's what Jesus wants to do in our hearts. He wants us to see where we're far off and just to say, you know what? We're so far off. We've got to sort that out. That starts in households, but it starts in the human heart. It's every single one of us saying, wherever I've fallen short, Jesus, I'm turning away from it and I'm embracing your truth. Prophets bring correction and challenge. And they, and they particularly, they can often um, challenge the dominant like preconceptions of the things. Like, why do we believe this? Why are we doing that? Why has it always been this way? Is this what it says in God's word? Is there a better way to do things? Prophets can sometimes be a bit difficult in the, in, in, in the, in the ears. Yeah, Natalie's one. In the ears of teachers and pastors, because they're always sort of like, we should be doing this different. Because we think there's a different way of reflecting the heart of God. Prophets insist that the community obey what God has commanded, which is a great thing, isn't it? Almost in a bit of an uncompromising way. They're concerned ultimately with holiness. That we would be holy like he is holy. The immature expression of uh, the prophetic, and particularly when it's embodied in a person that's meant to build up the church, what it can look like is they can become belligerent activists, so they just want to go, 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 and set everything right, and almost slap everyone on the hand and tell them where they should be more faithful. Or paradoxically, they can get so frustrated with what's going on in the church, they disconnect, and they just go and have a relationship with God on their own, because they love him so much. And it's easier that way. And so prophets can often disconnect. The next one's evangelists. Shout out evangelists. Evangelists. What evangelists do, and there's lots of things they do, but they recruit. They're they're the recruiters. They do far more than recruiting, but just look for one word. Um, They're infectious communicators of the gospel and of God's truth. And they love people and love sitting with people and seeing the lights come on. Like We've got a wonderful evangelist in the church in Ade. Um, In Medway, we had another lady who Ade gets on like a house on fire with, and I'm not surprised, called Rhonda. When you're with an evangelist, you'll know you're with an evangelist, whether or not it's about God or not. So if you know anyone that really loves Apple products or really loves a football team, That's all they're going to tell you about. And before you know it, you're like, you know what? I really think I want to watch the England game tonight. I've not watched the England game for ages, but Adam loves it so much. He's convinced me. He's recruited me to the cause or he's recruited me to the cause of whatever else it might be. With evangelists, they're recruiting people to the the gospel message of salvation. They're sharing the story of God and they're helping people to figure out how it interconnects with their heart. They call for a personal response to God's redemption in Christ. They want people to get it. They're not happy just seeing people out in the world. Their heart breaks when they go to the city and they see thousands of people wandering around, many of whom don't know Jesus. Evangelists get brought to tears. And ultimately, they draw other believers to the mission of God. 
So they're like, right, you've been saved. Now you've got to go out and tell others this amazing story that's changed your life. Evangelists are all about that, as well as other things. But the downside of being an evangelist can sometimes be you get so focused on reaching the outside world that sometimes discipleship in that process can get a little bit lost or the need to be amongst the church. I knew someone once in a, uh, in a previous time um, and they, they were so just felt so passionate and called to the lost that it got them into a place where actually they had a, a, quite a high disregard for the church. And that's a problem. You know, you can't say, well, I just love lost people so much, I don't ever want to meet with other people. It says, doesn't it, don't give up meeting with others as some are in the habit of doing. The next one is the shepherds. So I say shepherds. Shepherds, and they nurture and they protect. So you think of a good shepherd. We don't really have shepherds in our day and age, really, do we? Not that we see. Um, but shepherds, they nurture and protect. They're caregivers of the church community. And so what they do, they focus on the protection and the spiritual maturity of the flock. Um, and so one of the things I used to preach quite often was that we're all sheep. And sheep are, you know, forgive me for saying this. I'm not saying, well, I am. But um, sheep can be pretty stupid. They need protecting. They can wander into, they can get stuck in bushes. And then they, they, they haven't really got a reverse gear. So they need helping out when they get stuck. They need a shepherd to go and save them. They're um, really tasty lunch for wolves. And so they've got, you know, just sheep need a lot of protection. They're high maintenance. You might think a sheep isn't high maintenance. They wouldn't need a shepherd if they weren't high maintenance. Shepherds are thinking about the care of God's flock. They're thinking about us. They're thinking about these cultural trends and things that are coming into the church that are trying to knock us off course. This is what they're doing. And they're trying to create a, an environment where there's health, spiritual maturity and deep relationships. And so th they're thinking of the, f the church in a way that perhaps sometimes the evangelists aren't because they're thinking go, go, go. Or the apostles even sometimes. Um, and then a, an immature expression of, of shepherding, when it's not fully sort of matured, what that can look like is just really valuing the, the stability and the peace of the church and then uh, to the expense of the mission. So it's just a sense of us all, oh, it's so great being, and it becomes a bit inward. And we're just like, uh, uh, people sometimes say it's like huddle and cuddle. We just huddle and cuddle one another to glory. And um, that's not great, is it? And so sometimes they can lose sight of the bigger things. So they need the apostles and the evangelists to get the eyes out onto the nations and onto other people. And sometimes shepherds can create a dependence on themselves. So what, what should I do with my life? Tell me what the Bible says. Well, no, actually, you read the Bible and discern it yourself. The Holy Spirit wants to talk to you through it. But sometimes that person becomes the counsellor for the whole church. That, again, is really unhealthy. Their job, actually, is to help the church to all be able to read the Bible in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the things Brian often encourages, isn't it? Everybody get in the Word. Don't be dependent on one person to tell you what it means because it's a priesthood of all believers. And then the last one is the teachers. Say teachers. <laughs> teachers. Are there any teachers in the room? I'm not sure if there are today. We love our teachers, don't we? Um, teachers understand and they explain. Um, and so they're communicators of God's truth and his wisdom. They help others remain biblically grounded to better discern God's will. They guide others towards wisdom. So when they see people making bad decisions, they'll try and show them, not this is my opinion, but actually where it is in the Bible, that this isn't a way of living that honours God. So they're calling people to faithfulness in a, in a different way, but similarly to how the prophets do, but using God's word. And they help the community to remain faithful to the Bible. As for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord and we can't do that apart from the Bible. If I'm always saying, I think the Spirit's telling me this, I think the Spirit's telling me that, well, he may be, but it, that you've also got your marching instructions in the Word of God and he's not going to contradict that at all because he loves it, he wrote it, he inspired it over generations. And so these two things work together, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Not 50-50, but 100 and 100% for both ones. That's one of our values as a church. We're 100% words and we're 100% spirit. We believe that the Spirit wants to lead us and guide us into all truth, but all truth is in the Word of God as well. And so those two things work together. Teachers, when they look immature, they can become dry. They be can become academic. They can often have not a lot of life in stuff. It can become quite dutiful. Um, maybe quite intellectual or dogmatic, maybe a bit legalistic. Like one of the words, if I was to use it, is Pharisee. When all you do is love the word, but there's not any life to it, it that's what the Pharisees were guilty of, wasn't it? They knew the word of God inside out, but they were like whitewashed tombs. There was no, it was death on the inside. Looked great, whitewashed on the outside, 
but a tomb on the inside. That's what Jesus said, whitewashed tombs. And so we want, when we're in the Word of God, we want it to be bringing life to the body. That's their job. The teacher's responsibility is to use the Bible to lead us into all truth. Um, and again, another weakness, they can sometimes fail to see the personal or the missional aspects of the church's ministry. Because it's just all about, if you just read the Word of God, that's enough. No, you do actually have to go out and share the gospel with people for them to get saved sometimes. You know, you do actually have to go out and love the poor. You do actually have to go out and uh, cuddle the brokenhearted and pray for the sick. These things don't happen if all we do is sit in our front rooms. And so there's this sense of we all need one another. So there are strengths and weaknesses in each of these gifts. Much like with the footballing analogy I was using with FIFA, for some of us, there will, there'll be strengths and weaknesses in, in other areas. And so what I want to do, I'm just very quickly, this is just for my own interest. I'm just going to ask you to pop your hand up. And uh, if you most resonate with what I described in the Apostle, either in its fully mature state, or even actually, I'm a bit like that, the immature state. You know, sometimes I can cause people to do this or that. I'd love you to pop your hand up. Do you think that you've got some apostolic DNA? You might actually pop your hand up for two or three. I think we've got different measures of each of these. Just we're stronger in one or two of the others. So hands up if you think you would say, yeah, actually, I think I've got a bit of apostolic DNA. You might not be like the Apostle Paul. Like I said, Billy Graham and the... You know, there's a different measure. Hand up. No hands? I'm not sure. Maybe one or two at the back. Brilliant. See that hand? Next one is prophets. So I know there'll be a few hands here. Yeah. So the prophets in the room, definitely. And I'd recognize that in both of you. Three. Yeah. Evangelists. If you think that you're someone who's a recruiter to the course. Yeah. I thought that hand would have gone up a lot quicker. <laughs> Shepherds, if you've got a real heart for people, caring and bringing health and life, make sure everyone's all right. The community is healthy, the family of God. Look, this is great that we've got a lot of shepherds in the room. And just as a little anecdote, Brian and Hazel have said thank you so much to everyone that's been not only praying for them, but making meals, popping around. In, in, I know that Hudson's went around there yesterday to say hello. A lot of people have been dropping in and out, taking food over, to the point where they've said, just hold off with the food for a bit because we've got so many meals and so much leftovers. We can't eat anymore and we can't put it in the freezer. So I think Natalie's been part of organising that with uh, a few others. And so when that was Bronwyn, actually, thanks Bronwyn that took the lead with that. I think their household. So well done, the Hudson's household. But that's what a shepherding community, whether, imagine us as a church, where are we leaning to? Clearly, we've got more shepherds amongst us than we have. Not a single hand went up for the apostolic, thinking about the nations, thinking about advance. Hands up if you think you got the teaching gift, if you're a teacher. Brilliant. Is that Albert? Yes, a few teachers amongst us as well. And so really what we want to see is those gifts, not just that we get them to do all of the teaching, although that is part of it because you want to receive from the gift, but all of these gifts actually are teaching and equipping gifts. So when people have got these gifts, the mature expression of that, when it's fully fledged, is actually the ministry of Jesus. You think of Jesus. Was Jesus a sent one? Was he the great apostle? Give me an amen. He, amen, of course he was. He was the sent one, sent by the Father in the power of the Spirit to come into, he, he descended, didn't he? It says here, into our world to lead us as the trainer into freedom. Was Jesus the prophet of God? Of course he was. He fulfilled all of the prophetic words. All of the Old Testament, 300 prophecies, many of them talking about things that he couldn't fulfill even if he tried, like where he would born and what his death would look like. Things that were completely out of his control. He was the prophet of God. He knew God's will and he was calling people like prophets do back to faithfulness in God. Was Jesus the great evangelist? Yeah. Of course he was. He's a great evangelist going out, saying to people, come, follow me. Let me tell you about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus taught on the kingdom of heaven far more than anything because he was the great evangelist, the recruiter to the cause. And like it says here, he led a great train, not just here, but he descended into hell and led souls out of hell. How cool is that? You might be a good evangelist. You ain't doing that. I promise you. No matter how good you are, you can be Daniel Chand or Billy Graham. You're not doing that, but you're stopping people getting there, which is great. Was Jesus the great shepherd? Of course he was. You can't read Psalm 23 and not think of Jesus, can you? Jesus was the great shepherd, coming to draw the family of God together, coming to, to lead and to guide and to bind, to use his rod and his staff to protect us, to lead us through the valley of the shadow of death and lead us into the green pastures. And is Jesus, was he the great teacher? Of course he was. 
He said, I'm the way, like we heard this morning, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. He himself is truth embodied, and so who better to teach you than truth himself? So where are you going to get your bearings from? Is it from someone else that's give, trying to lead you astray, or is it from the one who is truth embodied, God embodied? And so all of these gifts, these people gifts that have been entrusted to the church are so that we would grow up collectively to look like Jesus. No one of us is going to be fully orbed in all of those areas. But we, if we were really blessed, like the church in Jerusalem, and I think the church in Antioch was, they had mature expressions of all of these fivefold gifts. And that's why those places became apostolic sending centers to the nations. Because they had their heart on the nations. They had, were concerned with discipleship and community help, health. They were concerned with drawing people in and bringing people to salvation. They were concerned with seeing people saved, added and baptised and, and, and entrusted with the word of God. And they were concerned with the care and life of the community. If we're just all about any one thing, we're going to look really lopsided. And so for us as believers, it's not enough to say, well, I'm really strong in this area. Or maybe this is an area I'm gifted in and I'm just going to leave the rest to other people. We're all to play our part says about it, for those who aren't evangelists, do the work of an evangelist. Give it a go. Give it a try. Don't just think, oh, well, I don't like sharing the gospel. None of us really, unless you're an evangelist, none of us really like sharing. It's, it's scary. You don't know what the conversation is going to look like. But as we do it, we're partnering with the mission and ministry of Jesus. And we're partnering with the spirit in us who wants to lead us into seeing freedom in other people's lives, which is super exciting, isn't it? And so I'm just going to pray as we come into land. Sorry, I preached a little bit longer than I thought I would there. But hopefully that's been helpful. I felt like there were three responses. And I'm just going to pray. So I'll mention all three. And maybe one of these responses is relevant to you. So the first group, I felt like this thing of Jesus descending and leading people out of trouble into freedom. Um, is Jesus your king this morning? You might have been ba baptized, you might have prayed the prayer, but is he your king? Is he truly your king? There might be a response there this morning, just saying, Jesus, you know what, something's got on the throne of my heart, and it shouldn't really be there. And so, I'm just going to put this thing, I'm going to put you on the throne, and then everything else will find its right place. Might be something ungodly that you need to turn away from. It might be something that actually would find its right place because it makes a terrible God. And so that's the first response. The second response um, is this thing about being led astray. Have you fallen into deception? Is, is there something or someone that's come into your life that's leading you, like we said, like sin does, promising you everything, but ultimately is going to deliver you nothing? Initially seems fun, but ultimately will rob you of life. Have you fallen into that deception subtly or intentionally? If, if so, today is a great opportunity to repent. Jesus loves it when we repent. Because he can come in and do all that stuff. And then the third one uh, is, are you playing your part? Are you playing your part? It says that he has, verse 7, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And so you've been entrusted a spiritual gift. You might have been entrusted several. Like I said, we've got different strengths in different areas. But are you playing your part? Is that gift being employed? Is it being used? When you put your hand up, are you using the gift that you said, I've got of those five? I know there's many others that we've preached on. How are you using that gift? Not just to better your own life, but to enrich and build up the church. And if not, if you're not using it in the life of the church, could you start? That is a conversation Natalie and I and other leaders would love to have a chat with you about how you could engage that gift, whether it's apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, or one of the other gifts, gift of giving, helps, whatever it looks like, gift of service. It looks beautiful when it's used in the church because actually it brings life to other people. That's what Paul says, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. Paul used his gift to serve the church wasn't all about him, was it? He was serving the church. And it wasn't straightforward, but he loved it. And so, King Jesus, I thank you so much for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you descended and you ascended. And then in some weird strategy, and it's hard to make sense of, the best way was for you to entrust something of a measure of yourself to us through the use of spiritual gifts that we could lead and encourage and guide and strengthen one another. 
and ultimately reach a broken world. Uh, Lord, I do pray for our church here that you'd help us to reflect the mature body of Christ, that we'd be building one another up, we'd be forgiving and persevering with one another, that there'd be a real sense of us growing and uh, other gifts getting added and being sort of emerging in the human heart. I pray for our young people that as they grow, they'll start to get a sense of what you've entrusted them as grace gifts and that we'll benefit from them in years to come. Lord, we thank you so much for those this morning who, um, who are going to make you the king of their heart. Who are going to cross that great Red Sea and say, I want to follow Jesus into freedom. Uh, Lord, I thank you for those who are recognizing that perhaps they've fallen into deception. That there's something that they've fallen in line with that isn't of you. And that they're repenting this morning. Lord, I thank you and I pray that you'll come in and meet them in that place of need. And p- p- place of vulnerability. And uh, Lord, we do pray for our church. We pray Lord, for every gift to be employed and to be used for your glory, King Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everybody.